Good morning, Valti's uh, family. It's, uh, it's really sad that I can't be with you this morning and I miss you all. just want to say that I'm really uh, privileged to be able to share this message with, this, with you this morning and that I pray that you would find God's countenance, you'd find God's presence, and you'd come to understand just how much God loves you. I'd like to start off with opening reading this morning, Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I've taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver, deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to the enemy, but have set me my feet in a spacious place. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak and so with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish. And my years of groaning, my strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbours. I am a dread to my friends. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I am forgotten by them, though I was I were dead. I become the broken pottery. For I hear the slander of many, there is terror on every side. They conspire against me and they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. So let us come to the Lord in our prayers this morning and let's open with a word of prayer. So Father God, we say thank you this morning for the beauty of another day. And as you've opened this day for us, Lord, we pray that your presence would be about us as we look outside the blue skies and the green in the trees, Father, and the change of season, Father, we know that you are a God of constants, that you never change, Father. We just come to you this morning with open hearts to receive a message from you, Father. We just pray and give you all the honour and all the glory, Lord, for your presence in our lives for your majesty, for your mystery, for your might, for your grace. And Lord, as we continue in the service, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to each one of us in the place that we are at now, Lord, that you would enlighten us, that you would lift our spirits. And Lord, in these dark days of un uncertainty and the unnatural way of life currently, Lord, we know, Lord, that you walk every step with us. That as you say, I am the way, the truth and the life. Whoever comes to me comes to the Father. And we just pray, Lord, that that would be the case this morning. That as we feel slightly rejected, we may feel sad, we may feel hurt, we may feel joyous, Lord. We know that all these emotions are within us before you created them. And Lord, we rest upon the knowledge, Father, that you created us in your image that you created us to be fulfilled in this life and Lord, that anything that comes across our path Lord that you walk with us and nothing can take away our joy nothing can take away our life in you Lord Jesus and as we continue Lord we give you the thanks and all the glory this morning in Jesus name we pray Amen so I entitled this sermon this morning, God has many promises in times of uncertainty. You know, we live in uncertain times in our, in our, in our world today, and especially with COVID-19 now, it has turned everything upside down and forced us to relook really the journey we're on. What is really the meaning in our lives and how precious our lives are. A certain question in the context of this morning's message is, what is life when Jesus says, I am the light. Here in South Africa currently do we find that's so disturbing and going on around us that it detracts from our belief and our trust in God. Some of the things that are going on 
or, or disturbing and takes away our joy and it makes us unhappy and it makes us uncertain. The norms and values in our lives have become blurred and we find it difficult to know what's right and what is right in the eyes of God. The world doesn't know the character of God. People have moral standards that are their own and people don't believe or like the promises Jesus gave his disciples. We see from our text that the disciples were fearful and they had doubts and there was uncertainty. This is very much what we are experiencing today. It amazes me that even Jesus there, Jesus amongst the disciples, having lived with them for three years, the disciples did not still quite know who he was. Maybe but they doubted that he was God. I just want to read the text this morning. So our reading, gospel reading comes from the book of John, the Gospel of John. Let me read from chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. And probably this is a fantastic passage for the times in which we find ourselves. It's entitled, Jesus Comforts His Disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. But you also will be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Look, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered him, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? and that the Father is in me. The words I say to you are not my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe in the ev on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I'll tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And this is the word of the Lord. I think for us today, as we live in a world which does not know God, it is so much more important for us as Christians to really know God. If the disciples found it difficult, and we too find it difficult, to always see God in everything, I believe God understands and that is why Jesus tells us to know him, to trust him, so that we can know the Father and have all the assurance of his comfort and his care for us. For me, I get the sense that Jesus has been somewhat frustrated by the lack of understanding from the disciples in our passage from John this morning. Firstly, we see Thomas who didn't know where Jesus was going and how he was expected to know the way and secondly, from Philip, who asked Jesus to show him the Father. Do we suffer from the same unknowns, blinded by these truths, because of our insecurities, as we expose our lack of faith in Jesus too? The term, getting blood out of a stone, is what Jesus must have felt like when he dealt with the disciples and when he deals with us. Just as when he had to deal with so many of those folk and those people back way back in the old times when you walk the earth. You can imagine Jesus saying, I tried to talk and convince my disciples, but I might as well have tried to get blood out of a stone. Almost impossible. Yet we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, that Jesus is the cornerstone and the capstone on which our lives, on which the very church is built. This Jesus is the rock of refuge, of which David writes in Psalm 31. A definition of a capstone from the dictionary means the top stone of a structure, the crowning achievement, 
the culmination or the final touch. So we see knowing Jesus is crucial to knowing God. There's nothing, no one more important than Jesus. Jesus does tell us that no one goes to the Father as we read in John. I am the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. If we see this Jesus, our Jesus, as a rock of refuge in our lives and we see him as the cornerstone and foundation and capstone of our lives, then we know that nothing is impossible for us to do in Christ. Out of this living stone did come blood, the impossible made possible. Our redemption and promise of an eternal life out of this rock did come the life-saving blood of Christ and a new life for each of us filled with promises from God, promises from Jesus himself. As a church we are set apart and each one of us are here as living stones to be built into a spiritual house. Jesus being the foundation of our lives and the foundation of the church. As forgiven and restored believers, we have a direct access to Jesus. You know, each one of us has a responsibility to go to God directly to confess and receive forgiveness of our sins. We have a responsibility to live holy lives representing the Holy God before a sinful and distrusting and lost world. We have a responsibility to praise God in our words and actions, offering ourselves as spiritual offerings every day of our lives. And we have a responsibility to study God's word and teach it to others. Our churches are under attack. I know there were two American pastors who were arrested for saying that Jesus is the only way. It's quite scary. It is though Jesus that it is through Jesus that the church has become the Israel of God. We all have to fulfill a priestly role. Instead of running away, we must remain in the church. Especially now when we are so divided. Church is not the building in Veltis. Church is within us, within us as community. The church for me has grown, if you look at it, over the last few weeks. So many more people that are seeking God and reaching out to God. And I bet you're doing more reading of your Bible and listening to godly messages than ever before. We must work with the church to carry out God's will and plan. We must work for and not against the church. We must not rebel when the church, uh, when the church discerns God's will, uh, will differently from what we want. We are a willful people, but do we follow God's will? We are to co or cooperate in our own differences with each other. I'm reminded of that Pink Floyd song, Just Another Brick in the Wall. It was an anti-establishment song. It was man's refusal to belong to an ordered system. We see that the world does not want order. The church is now the chosen people of God, the new Israel. And as Christians, we take over the identity of Israel. The law of Moses does not create God's people, but the grace of God in, in Christ does. So this morning, we need to look at three things that might help us to know God better. And these are, what is the character of our God? We look at what is the character of a moral person? And then we need to look at the promises we find in our reading this morning from John's Gospel. So if we look at the character of God, we can understand why the way that the world is currently, and why it is in the state it is in. As Christians, we look at the scriptures and we see that the testimonies about God say that God is good. He is good in nature and character. If you read Psalm 25 verse 8 tells us God is good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. I'll read that again. Psalm 25 verse 8 tells us God, good and upright, is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. God's actions are also good. He doesn't do things just for the sake of doing them. His laws are just and good. 
in past times, a king could pass a law, and if you didn't obey it, or even if you did not agree with the law, the king would chop off your head. Or he'd crucify you. The Romans were really rough in those early days. Our God is not like that. God has good intentions in his heart for his people. God is holy more than he is good. God is holy more than he is good. God is higher, greater, and bigger than anything or anyone, and so much so that he is to be feared. And I believe to fear God is not a punishment, but it's a loving respect. There is no one or thing like God. For us to be holy, we must have holy behavior, to mirror our behaviors on Jesus Christ, the same behaviors of God. We become holy when we become like God. 1 Peter 1 verse 16 says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If I obey God only because I fear God, that is good, but immature. God doesn't want us to fear Him. God wants us to obey Him. Because I trust and love and want to obey Him is an attitude of much greater holiness than having fear of God's wrath or punishment. God's loving kindness tells me that God wants a relationship with you and I and all the people out there. It's very quiet out there. The neighbors are sent messages and yes, how are you? But that's as far as it goes. But God seeks them too. This gives us an idea of the loving nature of God, His loving kindness. God's unfailing love, even for the sinner, is never static or stationary. His love is always towards someone or something. His love is not just a word or nothing that gives us and comes up and goes into the universe. No, it is targeted to you and I and all people. God's unfailing love transforms us and we are changed by it. In John 13, we see when Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples, he said, I'll give you now a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. So we are to reach out in love to those neighbors who are quiet and don't know God. How wonderful it would be if we all lived by this command. I would take it a little further and say that this is what makes Jesus real. To the world. I have a feeling Jesus meant for the love to be shared amongst his disciples to be spread further to every corner of the world. Secondly, if we look at the character of a moral person, having morals is important in our society and having Christian morals is only the only way we will make the necessary changes in our beloved South Africa today and also in the world today. You know, for me it's amazing if you do a Zoom and how people are greeting each other, actually taking time to, to ask how people are. How's the family? How are you doing? Are you coping? If you look at pre-COVID, you would walk past someone and say, oh, you know, I'm fine. And that would be the, the, the limit of the conversation. So maybe COVID is a blessing in that way that we are now looking at each other, listening to each other taking time for each other, being still in God's presence. Yes, it is possible to be a moral person without being a Christian. We see good people around us all day. God expects more from us though. He wants us to have Christian morals as we learn from the scriptures and he wants us to promote the kingdom of God to the whole world. Love, peace, joy. Love, peace, joy. Love, peace, joy is something that really comes to light at Christmas time and then it goes away. Love, peace, joy should be a continual event in every single day. A moral person thinks rationally. We don't rely on our feelings, but rather we think about what is good or bad. If we only go on our feelings, then we are irrational. We must think and act responsibly. As Christians, we choose to be different. Look before we leap is the saying that tells us to be different. As Jesus did, so should we act according to a set of principles. Jesus did nothing except the Father's will. If we lead our lives following God, we will be sanctified as God makes us holy like Him. Service, respect, values and love become who we are. A moral person is obedient to Almighty God. 
And thirdly, we need to look at what are those promises that God gives us. And this, this beautiful book, the most well-read book in the world, is filled with so many promises. And if we look at our reading from John this morning, we hear Jesus making wonderful promises to us, which we can hold dear to our hearts. Firstly, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. I'll come back for you. And Jesus tells us that we know how to get there. We need to trust Him and trust in God. Jesus tells us that He is the way, the truth and the life. Today, as we sit here in our homes, we need to rely on this promise and know that we are saved. We are different from what is going on in the general world and in South Africa today. If you know me, you know the Father. Yes, we know God. Isn't that not awesome? Because we know Jesus, we know God. You will do greater things than I if you have faith in me. Do you believe that you, here this morning, have the power to heal, to change the course of history? Imagine you have the power of Jesus because he wills it. He gives us that power if we have faith in him. It only takes faith in Jesus for us, for him and the Holy Spirit and God to unlock the power within each of us. And some of you sitting there this morning will have heavy things in your heart. There might be great sorrow, great pain. There might be areas in your life, especially now, where you might have lost some income, might have lost your job. Jesus' promise says, I will do anything you ask in my name. I will do it. Jesus has not abandoned us. We can always ask in prayer and he will do it. So as we conclude this morning, the character of God is good. We have moral principles by which we as followers of Jesus live our lives. We have all these wonderful promises that Jesus gives us. We have all these statements and encouragements from the text today. Don't let your heart be troubled, but trust in Him. Verse 1 of our reading. Verse 2 gives us, take a hope in what is prepared for you, your heavenly home. In verse 3, take hope in Jesus as a soon return for His bride. He's coming back to collect His church. Don't compromise on the message of salvation. And freely share it in verse 6. And live your life with a reliance on His life. To know, to see, to hear Jesus is to know, to see and hear God. Jesus referred to Himself many times using rich imagery, which if we try to understand, if we look out for Him and we listen for Him, then we will find Him. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He also said, I am the bread, the water, the light, the door, the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the true vine. Emphatically, Jesus said, you must ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. So why not this morning take Jesus up on his offer and ask him to reveal more of himself in your life. Ask him in his name to bring life into that situation that creates doubt in your life this morning. For he will do it. If only we could get this message to the people out there. This is what we need to do. And I pray this week you will have a great opportunity and you will take a great opportunity to live in the goodness of our God. To love by his moral principles and to tell others of the promises Jesus has for them as he has for each one of us. We do this for those who want to follow the King. Amen. So wonderful Welty's folk and those that are going to be listening to this and watching this message this morning, let us close in prayer. And may this week be a blessing as we struggle through this difficult time. Father God, we thank you for this message this morning, Lord. We thank you for those that have opened their hearts, minds and ears to hear. And Lord, you have calmed the world in the sense of all this uncertainty you've brought people to reflect. We just pray, Lord, that they would reflect on you, that they would look at your goodness and come to understand the great character of our God. 
We thank you, Jesus, that you came to save each one of us. You came to reveal God to us. You came to show us the way. You came to teach us the truth, the real truth about the meaning of life. And you came to give us life, Lord, and we say thank you. We pray all these things in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ.